Welcome to the Performance Hub. I'm your host, Anne Guzman. When you step inside, you can expect to hear valuable conversations about sports science, nutrition, mindset, and navigating change in life. I'm super excited to share today's conversation with Dr. Emily Krauss. And Emily is a sports medicine physician from Stanford University who specializes in bone health and in particular in runners. But today we focus on runners, cyclists, and even just bone physiology, where Emily gives us an amazing analogy of how bone remodels. And then we step into a conversation about the impact of inadequate nutrition on bone and even how overuse and lack of rest impacts our bone health. We also pivot to talk about vitamin D and calcium intake and why that's important, but yet it doesn't act as a magic bullet if your nutrition is not up to par. There are so many interesting things in this conversation, so I'm excited to get started. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did, and I will see you inside the Performance Hub. Thank you so much for listening. Okay, I'm excited to have Dr. Emily Krauss here today. And Emily's a sports medicine and orthopedic specialist at the Stanford Children's Health Center, where she's focused on rehabilitation of sport-related injuries and prevention of those same injuries with the focus on running and bone health. And she's super passionate about running and recently blasted a 250 marathon, which is awesome, and we'll have to talk about that. She's passionate about biomechanics of runners and cyclists, and I was really excited to learn about Emily's practice because I have a keen interest in bone health and endurance athletes, and in particular cycling, which I also read, Emily, that you have also taken up cycling, so that's super exciting. And I'm honored to have you here today. I'm eager to learn from you and and share valuable information that we discuss with listeners. So welcome, and thanks so much for taking the time. Thank you so much, Anne. I'm really honored to be on this podcast. I'm excited to chat. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. So I have read that you've known you wanted to be in sports medicine from quite a young age. So I think that's amazing. And I'm always a bit envious of people who are so sure of their path. However, I'm also, I, I really admire it because to me, it just screams that you must have such a deep connection with why you do what you do. So before we dive into bone health and nutrition and overuse injuries and cyclists and runners, I'm really curious, at the end of the day when you sit down, or even if you get lost in the busyness because you research and you have clinical work and you're obviously an accomplished athlete, what comes into the back of your mind if it, if it ever gets so busy and crazy uh, that reminds you why you do what you do? Oh, that's a really good question. And I feel like we all have those tendencies to get so wrapped up into work and almost buried and you're kind of neck deep into a project and kind of don't can't even see the end of it. And sometimes um, it, it does, you do have this moment of despair, like why, why am I putting in all this effort? And um, I think I really go back to um, kind of my own passion for being physically active and um, grew up really active in multiple different sports. And um, we had a really active family, so that was um, super encouraging. And an injury um, can be really devastating and can um, sideline an athlete for a a period of time. And I really wanted to, I really want to connect continue to find ways to get an athlete, whatever type of, whatever level they are, whether it's an elite athlete, a professional, a weekend warrior, or a young athlete, um, back to their activity that they love to do as um, quickly and safely and um, in the smartest way possible. So that they come back smarter and stronger than um, when they um, presented pre-injury. And, and that's that's a big motivation for me is that I can I can help make that difference um, through either direct clinical care, through research, through outreach and education, um, through these types of podcasts to just educate. And I, I just love what you're doing to try and kind of spread the word and spread the good word of um, just important things to keep athletes healthy. Oh, thank that's you. A long-winded answer. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's amazing. I mean, there's got to be a, a lot behind why you do something that's so, you know, it's very consuming and takes a lot 
of your time. But really, the sporting community is just lucky to have physicians like you who are so passionate about keeping athletes healthy and out there doing what they want to be doing. And again, it sounds obviously from everything I've read about you, you completely relate to this because you are an athlete. And that's super important, I think. Uh, we have a lot to unpack today, and I know that uh, we've chatted a little bit about our um, mutual excitement about bone health. <laughs> which is, yes. Most people probably are like, what? But <laughs> I, was, I was hoping to start just by having you walk through a bit of basic bone physiology. And it's not that I want to get all super scientific, but I do think it's important to, to just lay some groundwork for the conversation. So it gives people who maybe don't know a lot about how bone is made, just a bit of context when we are talking about bone or osteopenia or, or low bone mineral density. So that can help maybe even a, a visual or just some context as we carry through. So I'm wondering, could you explain what, like what is bone remodeling and what's happening when our bones are remodeling in our bodies? Yeah, um, I always love chatting with a fellow bonehead, and so <laughs> this is this is right in my wheelhouse. Um, I, you know, we had kind of talked offline about um, a good analogy, and I actually came up with a good analogy, and I'm pretty excited about it. So awesome. if you if we if you get lost, just interrupt me, and I can we can redirect. But um, I I'm going to compare it to a, a new bike. So say um, you, Anne, got a shiny new bike with this fancy paint job. You love your bike so much and naturally want to ride this shiny new bike all of the time. And of course, you want to ride it in all of the elements um, because that's a, an avid cyclist. That's what we do. In the, um, the rain, the high heat, the bitter cold, um, in the gravel, road, everything. And of course, with time, you think about that bike and you think about that shiny paint job and the paint occasionally has micro cracks and micro chips. And um, you, as an attentive um, bike owner, um, pay attention to this and lay on new paint to those areas of those micro trips and um, micro cracks because um, you want to keep riding. So you lay on the paint and then you go um, ride more. So um, the stronger the weather, the more the paint chips and cracks. So the more elements you write in, the more that that paint is going to break down and the more attention you need to pay to repainting and laying on new paint to those areas of um, kind of more great, most vulnerable areas. Mm -hmm. So if you ride in the storm and the elements too much without adding more paint, or maybe you don't let the paint dry, you, you keep riding, um, nice. those micro cracks are going to get bigger and that frame may rust and potentially break. So kind of paralleling this to um, life is um, you kind of think of that body or frame of the bike as your skeleton. And the weather and the elements are varying levels of training. So um, that's kind of more intense training, more volume, more duration. Um, and then the the paint itself is is the um, the paint microchips, excuse me, and the repainting is that bone re remodeling. So um, really, that paint is full of these top notch ingredients for your bike frame. So you think about um, your nutrition, your vitamins, your minerals, all of those things. And all of that plays um, an important role in um, kind of keeping the the skeleton healthy healthy. So that's kind of my my best example that I can think of. And I mean, it's not p p perfect, but... That's um, a great analogy. Yeah, <laughs> that's fantastic. Because I find it so difficult because when we go to the gym, we work out our muscles, we either know that they're stronger through performance or we see that they're growing. But then with bone, it's so hard to, to connect to what's happening in there because it's not like, oh, look at my bones. Like mm -hmm. they're looking awesome. So yeah, it's great to, to have a visual of what's happening when you're chipping away or, you know, laying down new bone. Um, so thank you for that amazing way to visualize it. Um, a, a couple other words that people are going to be familiar with, but maybe don't quite know what they mean would be osteopenia and osteoporosis. And I feel like a lot of people just assume those words are pertaining to very old people. 
but that's definitely a mistake as we've seen stories in the media of 20 year old runners with osteoporosis. So it is possible to get these bone diseases as young people as well. So could you just explain like what is osteopenia and osteoporosis? Yeah, um, I, I can relate that these I mean, patients who present to me and they get diagnosed with osteopenia and osteoporosis, they come in very scared. And I um, often think that these definitions can be confusing and sometimes misused, especially when referring to the athletic population. Um, I am going to get into some, some definitions, so um, yes. kind of bear with me, but um, I like to use um, kind of frame it around bone mineral density. So that's one measure of bone health and the easiest to measure um, in bone for bone health that we use um, clinically. And the way we measure bone mineral density is through um, a special type of imaging um, called a DEXA scan, um, which is stands for dual energy X-ray absorptiometry. And it's a little bit of um, radiation, but it gives a lot of information on overall bone health that we can um, use to kind of quantify the degree of bone mineral density for um, an athlete or an individual. So um, the American College of Sports Medicine um, actually defines low bone mineral density in, um, and they use this definition for young premenopausal weight-bearing female athletes as a Z-score, so that's the score that they use to measure bone mineral density for DEXA scans, um, between negative one and negative two. And they'd only use osteoporosis, that definition, um, as a Z-score of less than negative two in the setting of clinical risk factors for fracture. So I think um, we have to be a little careful as far as when we use the word osteoporosis, because it still kind of has this stigma around it. And mm -hmm. I do like to kind of frame it more in that low bone mineral density um, range because especially in a younger athlete, there's a lot of potential to regain some of that bone mass, and especially kind of when right. we're talking about late teens, early 20s. Um, as we um, gain birthdays, that becomes more challenging. Yeah. Uh, okay. And then... Now, go ahead. Oh, uh, then it gets a little more confusing because... Um, as I had mentioned, that definition is only for young premenopausal weight-bearing female athletes. So what about the rest? And so um, you, we kind of, we often extrapolate and, and try to apply that same definition to um, male athletes. Um, but there are other um, definitions that, for example, the International Society for Clinical Densitometry uses um, for premenopausal women and men less than 50 years of age that also um, gives some of those definitions. And I can, I can if it's easier to kind of, um, kind of reference those um, separately, I can do that too, um, just because kind of throwing around a lot of, of yeah, values yeah, no, that's okay. is, so, is challenging. So when you talk about a, like a Z-score, mm -hmm. is there a, because that's based on a mean, correct? Mm -hmm. Is there a comparison for athletes to athletes? Oh, I wish. Um, so right now, the Z scores that we use are um, age matched and um, sex matched. So mm -hmm. um, they're matched with um, kind of all comers, and that's part of the challenge of using these Z scores. Is you would expect, especially in a in a runner, you would expect a runner who's um, doing a lot of weight bearing activity to naturally have probably a higher bone mineral bone mineral density and stronger bones because they're putting a lot of stimulus into those bones over time um, compared mm -hmm. to um, a kind of more sedentary individual of the same age, same sex. Um, so I think um, it becomes challenging. So that's why they use those um, different definitions to kind of include that low bone mineral density between negative one and negative two, because in my mind, they're trending in the wrong direction and they're potentially at greater risk, especially given their um, more active lifestyle for developing um, a bone injury or bone stress injury or overuse injury to the bone. Okay. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So you mentioned kind of just the endurance runner and how you would think that, you know, they might have a better bone mineral density, but I know that you're very involved in research and the female triad and relative energy deficiency in sport. 
So I'm very keen to talk about how nutrition plays into the bone health of that runner who, again, we would say, oh, well, they're an athlete. They, they probably have really good bone health. And then there's the big butt. So before we just jump into reds, would you be okay just to define what relative energy deficiency in sport is? And then after that, like, how is that impacting that great analogy you made about bone remodeling? Like, why is the energy deficiency or how is it impacting that remodeling process? Yeah. So um, I like to start by just um, defining. So Relative energy deficiency in sport is an expansion of the female athlete and male athlete triad. So just so that everyone's on the same page, uh, making sure that they understand what the female athlete and male athlete triad is. Mm -hmm. um, so the triad, which is three interrelated components, um, stands for um, low energy availability with or without um, a an eating disorder, so it's number one, um, some degree of impaired bone health or low bone mineral density. So that could be a fracture history or a DEXA scan that demonstrates low bone mineral density. And then number three is um, irregular periods um, or absence of periods in females. And then a big word called hypogonad hypogonadotropic hypogonadism is um, what we see in males. And the real underlying contributor is this whole low energy availability piece. And so the nice thing about relative energy deficiency in sport is that it really expands on the triad to capture all of these other important health and performance consequences from that low energy availability. So, um, and I, we probably should define low energy availability also. Yeah, I was just gonna ask you that. <laughs> So um, low energy availability, as it, um, as the definition states, is um, that failure of an athlete to consume enough energy, so that's um, fuel, energy in, to cover um, the energy expended or um, the energy cost of exercise, as well as covering all the regular um, daily functions of um, kind of metabolism and health um, on a kind of baseline. So that um, has been measured and um, calculated through, um, which, and I'm sure you can give a greater, much greater definition, but um, basically energy intake, subtracting exercise energy expenditure divided by fat-free mass. And um, low EA or low energy availability um, is calculated around less than 30 kilocals per kilogram of fat-free mass per day is what they break it down to. Um, that's really hard for an athlete without um, amazing sports <laughs> dietitian um, resources uh, to yeah. be able to calculate. But um, that's a, that's a starting point, and that's kind of where this research has drawn the line to um, kind of demonstrate when a lot of physiological consequences happen, including um, disruptions in hormones that can uh, throw off um, the axis. And that um, the secondary consequences, kind of bringing it back to the bone, is that the, um, the bone remodeling potential um, decreases, leading to increases in that bone breakdown. So more, more chips of paint on the, on the bike frame and mm -hmm. decreased bone formation. So less paint being laid, laid on. And so I kind of use that whole rust analogy to kind of bring us back to that like... Um, the, the porosity, so the actual bone kind of loses um, some of that some of that density, and the quality um, drops. And so, um, unfortunately, you keep lay, like trying to remodel and lay paint on that rusty bone, and um, long term that can lead to um, consequences. So maybe even an athlete is doing okay now, um, but but a decade from now, some of those some of those earlier habits, um, you still have the rust underneath. And, and that's, it's really hard to um, kind of, especially the young athlete who's really competitive and kind of at, the, at their prime, kind of have them think about long-term consequences of their current habits. So, so yeah. yeah. How do you, um, 
let me just interject. Well, one thing. So you mentioned porosity. So would it be correct to picture maybe a sponge and how you have the little holes in there and to say porosity that those holes are kind of getting bigger and the little links keeping them together are getting thinner? Exactly. The, yes. The inside of your bone? Yes. Yeah, because I think sometimes that's like the part that, that's hard to visualize. Well, what do you mean my bones, you know, I'm losing bone mineral density, but mm -hmm. it's like the sponge is just, the holes are growing and yeah, it's, it's such an inter interesting visual. You just mentioned um, younger athletes and, and how do you get them to connect the dots? Because again, you don't feel your bones. You don't know if they're getting weaker. We're not getting DEXA scans when we're 15 to say every year, oh, how are your bones? Like that often doesn't happen until we're 40 or 50 or 60 or we break a bone. And so when you're in, you know, with the, your clinical work and you have a young athlete, and whether it's preventative or I guess even they've broken a bone, because maybe even then it's like, oh, whatever, I broke a bone, it'll heal. How do you try and convey the importance of bone health to like a 17, 18 year old athlete who, it, you know, it's very hard to imagine what life will be like when you're 50 or 60. I remember being 20 and I just didn't think about that. So I'm just curious how you do that. Yeah, that's it's a it's a challenge, and I feel like I approach it differently um, based on the the athlete and their motivation and kind of their maturity level too. But mm -hmm. um, I kind of I tackle it from a couple of different directions. One, um, talking about performance. Um, some of the athletes that's their that's kind of the carrot to to get them to listen and to uh, really make some important changes and changes to their um, habits and kind of daily daily patterns. Um, so a lot of the low energy availability and low energy availability in the whole um, relative energy deficiency in sports um, piece, um, yes, it affect, affects all these physiologic functions, but it can have a negative effect on overall performance and irritability and ability to kind of bounce back after a hard effort. And that um, can affect, be a be a problematic um, earlier on. And, and then if the athlete thinks about, especially if they're wanting to pursue a career in college, if they're making habits that are um, harmful to, to their bone and their um, ability to, to really build that peak bone mass, which really takes place in those adolescent years, those teen early teenage years, if mm -hmm. they make habits that decrease the ability to build that peak bone mass then, when they want to perform at their best, and they don't want to peak out, peak in, in high school. They want to peak yeah. in, in their collegiate and post-collegiate years. So if they start to make habits in their high school years that is going to lead to increased injury risk in their collegiate years, um, sometimes that's also um, kind of eye-opening to them. They don't realize um, how how impactful and long-term some of these um some of these habits that they're doing. And when I'm talking about the habits, I'm talking about potentially underfueling and or overtraining and um, kind of taking too much of maybe too much intensity, not enough, um, not enough easy days. I mean, you see all the time these kids, they just go hard, hard, hard all the time. And um, there, there are, there's a, a method to, to the, the types of training that they should be should be doing, and there's a reason behind it. And part of it is to maintain that energy balance and avoid that chronic energy deficit state. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And you're dealing with, you know, you're dealing with runners, and so I would assume in your practice you have a lot of examples that you can almost point to, um, not necessarily names, but maybe yes, names. Right. If if someone is really aware of a very successful athlete who has encountered a lot of stress fractures and is also a runner and you know has come out and had no problem talking about oh yeah I, I was dealing with reds and I, I wasn't meeting my energy needs and then that can serve as an example of look what can happen because maybe that can help them connect the dots if they see like their role models yes um, and then see them admitting to not admitting, but maybe, you know, it was brought to their attention that this is why they had the stress fractures. Because I, I agree, it must be really hard to get a young athlete to to really be like, oh yeah, my bones. Yeah, that's a, it's a really good point. And especially in the young, developing, malleable um, teenager, I mean, they're looking for, for good role models and they're looking for role models that are in their same sport. And mm -hmm. 
and thankfully, I feel like through, um, I mean, with even just within the past year, there's just been a lot of um, positive um, advocates for kind of a healthy approach to um, nutrition and fueling, a healthy approach to training. Um, and, and that can be really empowering to the athlete. And it's easier, um, to your point, to kind of reference those athletes that are so public and there are mm-hmm. articles about them. And I, we can reference them and they're, they're, sometimes the athletes will listen to the, the professional elite athlete more than um, a physician or a parent or even their coach. So. Yeah, no, that's that's definitely true. So I guess it's like take advantage of that. And I mean, a shout out to all the athletes who are vulnerable enough to come out with their stories, because I do mm-hmm. think that they make a difference. Like, I think it's really important to hear those stories. And, you know, then a younger athlete might be reading or, or watching going, oh, gosh, that's me. So I think mm-hmm. it's I think it's really great that that's happening. Um I just wanted to sidestep back to nutrition for a moment because something that I think just happens in general and with bone, but when people are not eating a really great diet, um, I'm sure there are millions of people with cupboards stacked with supplements who just Mm -hmm. think that by taking a supplement, you know, they can bridge the gap on what's missing in their nutrition. And I've heard this many times from from people that I've worked with, you know, maybe their nutrition is not up to par, but I'm taking my calcium and and vitamin D, so my bones should be good. So I thought this was a topic that would be really practical. And, you know, I think I haven't read much in media type articles about this, so it's always great to, to bring this out to listeners. So if you are in that state of low energy availability, so you're not eating enough to meet both your biological, physiological needs and your energy output from exercise. Um, And so now you're again, chipping away potentially a little more depending how chronic it is um, and what type of sport you're doing. If you just take your calcium and vitamin D, you know, can those supplements kind of save us? And what really made me you know, I wanted to hear what you had to say, especially because I read a paper you were an author on bone stress injury in runners. And you mentioned a study where Neves and colleagues, they showed that female runners who consumed 800 milligrams of calcium a day had a six-fold increase for stress fractures compared to those in taking 1,500 milligrams a day. So based on what we just discussed with that low energy availability, I was hoping you could talk to, you know, are these supplements still preventative of fractures like they were possibly in this study, even with low energy availability? You know, obviously that's not the ideal scenario, but do they still have that preventative ability or do you need both? Yeah, you really, um, I am really glad you brought this up because I think there is this idea that, yeah, supplements save all and they're kind of the the quick fix and Mm -hmm. it's really not the case. So this particular study, um, those female runners, they were, um, they also had irregular periods or some some menstrual irregularities, um, and so that that didn't it, those they and they were also consuming less calcium in addition to that. So what I see, and we did perform another study, interestingly, on iron supplementation, which um, is is another. Um, challenging topic about kind of supplementing with iron and blindly supplementing with iron and what that can potentially do, both the risks and the um, the benefits of iron. And mm-hmm. we found that the athletes who were supplementing more were the athletes that were at higher risk. So um, it was almost like they, they were trying to, yeah, go through that quick fix and mm-hmm. uh, maybe not address some of the um, low energy availability, thinking that they could fill in the gaps with with the the minerals themselves, but the overall the overall issue is the the quantity and and the quality too of the of the fuel that they put into their body is not enough to match their energy needs. So sure, um, I mean, kind of going back to the the bike and the paint analogy, um, think about the vitamin D and the calcium and even the iron as like the thickener of the paint. Um, it's going to yeah. thicken the paint, but you still need the actual paint itself to to, to cover those those cracks, and and they are important. And I, I would say that I would encourage trying to get those nutrients, those vitamins, minerals, everything from good wholesome food, 
And if there's still um, a deficit, especially if the athletes maybe has some history of, of injuries to bones, so bone stress injuries, um, then and ideally they're getting a lab workup. They're getting labs to explore, is their vitamin D level low? Is their calcium level low? Is their iron low? And then do they need to supplement in addition um, to, to their diet? Absolutely. That's great. I would love, I would love to hear about the iron study actually. Yeah. So um, this, the study was on um, female high school athletes and it was a pilot study, which is always a challenge trying to just get it off the ground. And um, big mm -hmm. shout out to Paige Scorth Scorseth, who is um, a med student in um, Wisconsin and was really critical. Um, she was a summer research intern at um, at Stanford that, that summer and just really got the study off the ground. And the paper has been ex accepted, so I feel um, comfortable sharing um, some of our some of our research. But um, we looked at we actually got DEXA scans on um, almost I think forty athletes, for 40, 40 oh, wow. female runners, and mm -hmm. um, interestingly, our best recruiting method was to go through um, Instagram and and have a lot of um, really well known, reputable um, runners post our our flyer on their oh, on their cool. Instagram and we're like okay we've figured out a new recruitment method for um, yeah, that's this, good to this generation yeah. <laughs> um, and we so we got iron levels we got um, estrogen levels we got vitamin D and we were really our, our hypothesis was to see if um, the athletes that had um, higher um, kind of female athlete triad risk factors uh, more menstrual regularity more disordered eating habits that they also had um, low iron. Um, okay. Because we saw that um, that low iron um, can actually negatively affect um, bone health, or sorry, yeah, bone mineral density through um, kind of growth hormone and thyroid hormones. To kind of get into okay. the a little bit of the um, scientific weeds with you, but um, the challenge that we found were was that a lot of the athletes were already supplementing with iron, and we were having a hard time. Um, turning away the athletes who supplemented because we found that those athletes who were supplementing also had more triad risk factors. So if you think about it, um, and a lot of these athletes, they didn't have a pre-iron level leading into um, our study. So they were blindly supplementing based on um, maybe another fellow athlete was supplementing or maybe their coach just kind of recommended it. And and for me, that's a, that's a problem because having an athlete just supplement, you might be missing an important opportunity to really um, discuss um, the importance of just good, well-rounded nutrition. And a lot of these athletes may not have needed to if they just um, found better ways to in include iron in their diet. Right. And they also may not have needed to supplement because their iron levels were already replenished anyway. So it could be harmful and they could be over supplementing. So I think it's really important to be careful and not just um, by kind of follow the follow the trends um, for the newest like hottest post post workout supplements and just make sure that's really um, conducive and fitting for um, your workout needs and and just um, kind of your specific nutrition needs. Oh, for sure, and it really comes back to that that whole like, oh, can I put a Band-Aid on this and, and take another supplement? Right. I mean, there's the, you know, there's a time and a place for, you know, we both know there's maybe a handful of supplements that actually improve performance. Like vitamin D is a little different if you live up here in Canada where I do. Um, maybe in the winter, you're going to take some vitamin D, but for sure with iron, I mean, that's, it's so common. I have people say, oh, should I just take iron? And it's like, wow, I mean, you can't just get that out of your system. And I think you know, that's not really talked about a lot as well. Like, you know, don't just pound in the iron. I mean, you need to bleed that or sweat that out. Mm -hmm. uh, correct me if I'm wrong there. But yep. yeah, it's, it is interesting how, how it's just, I'm going to take this, I'm going to take that. But really, as you say, if you come back to let's work on your nutrition and then measure again after you've been doing that for some time. And then again, going to see a sports medicine physician instead of just Dr. Google, right? Right. Which is definitely a problem. <laughs> Um, so we talked about runners and cyclists a little bit, and I find this really interesting and definitely something I can learn from you about. So I wanted to ask you, you know, when we're, we talked about conveying the importance of bone health to athletes, and I know a lot of your research is on bone stress injuries from overuse in runners. 
Um, in the case of a runner, you know, you have that stress fracture that can occur due in part to that pounding associated with the sport. And then combined with what we've discussed about that, possibly that low energy availability and what that's doing to chipping the paint away from the bike. I hope whoever's listening didn't just tune in because they would be like, <laughs> what is she talking about, the paint on the bike? <laughs> but if you, if you missed the beginning, go back to the great analogy. So without that pounding nature of the sport of running, so the deteriorating bone that could easily go unnoticed because you're not getting injured as a cyclist, you know, I'm going to take the sport of cycling. So it's non-weight bearing. You're out there, you're just riding away for hours a day. Possibly your bones are deteriorating if you're not meeting your energy needs. And of course, there's so many other factors, right? There's genetics. Are you smoking? Are you drinking? But if we're talking about nutrition, so in that type of sport, and again, that's another sport where um, whether correctly or not, right, low body mass and high energy expenditure are often seen in tandem. Of course, you know, body composition and power to weight does matter, but there's always a fine line on how much it matters and when it becomes uh, negative. So how do you convey preventative strategies for that cyclist who isn't getting stress fractures because they're not pounding and unless they crash and they're old enough that perhaps for some reason they were asked to get a DEXA, they think they're just fine. So I think that that's really challenging. I'm really curious how you would approach something like that. <gasps> Yes, and you highlight a very challenging area because oftentimes they aren't coming into my clinic um, for those overuse or bone stress injuries. Um, they might come in for other things like back pain or neck pain or um, kind of maybe some knee pain, um, but that's not really related to their to their bone health. And do you get clients actually? Sorry to interrupt. Uh -huh. Do you get clients that come in who are cyclists who have back pain or neck pain, and then you find out, oh, they're actually they actually have a fracture in their spine? Not, not a lot, unless there's um, some type, I mean, you think about the, I mean, that would be a really interesting case and there's probably would be some underlying um, bone disorder or kind of long, really, really serious um, mm -hmm. kind of osteoporotic state at that point, if they had a kind of compression fracture, unless there was some type of traumatic um, accident that they maybe didn't recall. They said, oh yeah, I fell off my bike and had um, pretty um, severe back pain, but I kept riding. Um, sometimes then you do see some, some, some compression fractures that can, can present themselves, um, but mm. less likely. But that's something to be, um, something to think about. And um, yes, historically, I feel um, cyclists can sometimes pride themselves and maybe their lower bone mineral density because it contributes um, to overall power to weight ratio. Um, oh, thankfully, wow. that's crazy. Like the hollow bike. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Great. My frame is getting thinner. It's yes. Lighter. Yes. It's lighter. Wow. Yeah. Um, and of course, this is flawed in many for many reasons, both short term and long term. And um, you highlighted the very important point. Um, cycling is a non-weight bearing sport and there are um, pretty good studies that show um, decreases in bone mineral density with the duration of cycling or comparing a, a cyclist to a to a, a runner or a, a sport that involves multi-directional movements like soccer or basketball. Mm -hmm. um, so there, so there is that that risk of um, of the of the sport, and it's something to to take into account that um, if you're purely riding the bike, um, doing no weight bearing, and potentially kind of riding a fine line where you're maybe at that chronic um, energy deficit or low um, energy state um, for too long, and or for a prolo prolonged period of time, then the the risk for um, low bone density goes up and the risk for um, a traumatic fracture or, or a more severe um, injury to the bone if, if a crash does occur, or even if it's a minor crash that you maybe wouldn't expect a fracture to occur, um, if the bones are already more fragile or if that paint is too thin um, or maybe there's rust below, um, that, that can lead to um, a, a more serious injury that could lead to delays in the return to sport. Um, it could lead to a surgical intervention if it's um, a more severe fracture that doesn't um, kind of leads to a non-union or if the fracture is displaced. Um, and it can le lead to chronic pain down the road. And then, so that's kind of the sh some of the short-term risks as far as um, bone. And then long-term, so say, say, you know, fast forward into kind of that 
pre, post, and menopausal for females um, time frame. Um, the overall other fragility fracture risk, like from just a, a basic fall, can go up. And so um, I think it's it's really important to kind of have a have a, a cyclist um, approach their training in um, kind of a little more multi-dimensional, literally multi-dimensional um, manner. Um, whether that's incorporating some weight bearing activity, um, it doesn't have to be running if you're not a runner. I'm not gonna, yeah. I'm not going to force that on anybody, but um, resistance exercise um, is, is super important, especially um, as athletes age and kind of um, progress through their training. And I really, um, the more I get into my training, the more I feel like I preach on um, resistance or strength training as a complement to um, endurance sport. So right. um, that's really important. And then really addressing that, that nutrition piece and making sure that they're um, being smart about their fueling. Um, kind of pre-fueling, fueling on the bike and refueling. Right. No, for sure. Yeah, I think it is It is so difficult, right? Because if you're not breaking anything, if it's not broken, you think you're fine. But how do you know until you break something? And I'm not sure what it's like in, I know in the USA, like we have uh, OHIP here. So I can just go and get a DEXA scan. Mm -hmm. I don't have to pay for that here. Um, is it super common that someone like 30 or 40 is getting a DEXA scan? No, but... When I asked for one, um, when I was 40, there wasn't a problem. So to me, I think, gosh, this should just be more available for you know, preventative measures because I find it so interesting that a lot of times you, you either have to be old enough or break something mm -hmm. to find out because you can't see it. So I find that whole concept interesting. If we have a diagnostic um, you know, tool like, why don't we use it until, and I understand that most people don't get osteoporosis maybe until they're older, but to me, it's all about the prevention. And like you said, you're trying to reach your peak bone mass when you're younger. You know, can't we peak inside a little earlier and see what's going on? I think so. I think we should. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why. Yeah. Um, and what is it like in California? Like, can you... Can you get a DEXA? Is this something that's expensive in the USA or is it not recommended unless you break a bone or you're at a certain age? Yeah. Um, the the usual recommendations for um, DEXA is, um, I just looked this up. So it's a history of one or um, more than one bone stress injury or um, a history of a traumatic, or excuse me, not traumatic, or a history of a high risk um, bone stress injury. So, um, for example, a stress fracture or bone stress injury of the femoral neck is a higher risk location because of the, the risk of um, non-union or a prolonged healing time. And okay. in those, um, then they kind of recommend a deeper workup. But in, in my mind, so if there's a, a known history of um, low energy availability or disordered eating, or if there's a known history of prolonged menstrual irregularities, or even in males, if they feel like a prolonged, um, I mean, the signs are a lot harder to, to tease out in, in males to um, determine if there's been a chronic energy deficit. But um, we often recommend um, if they're, they're complaining of kind of decreased sex drive, um, lack of morning erections, um, de or decreased libido, um, we that's something that you can start to ask about as far as nutrition. And you can order like a, a testosterone level. And if it's on the lower end, um, you could probably um, maybe argue a, a DEXA scan in that in that form. But oftentimes, I mean, thankfully, they're not incredibly expensive. They're not like an MRI, but there's, oh, okay. there's still some cost, cost involved. And um, I would hate for um, an athlete to feel like they have to get a DEXA and pay a certain amount. So um, if there's exactly. any question, yeah, about overall bone health, I think kind of starting with um, either a primary care doctor or even um, seeing a sports medicine physician and um, really someone hopefully with that with that knowledge to kind of um, ask those um, more important questions um, as far as fracture history and overall training um, history and um, dietary history. And even mm -hmm. like you, to your point, the genetics too. Um, I was just going to say that I know you're doing some research in genetics. <laughs> yes. so how, how much does that play in? Like, can you do everything right, but then 
just got that lot. So I I have another analogy, the bucket analogy. <laughs> and awesome. I love analogies. <laughs> So um, you can be, probably apply this to a lot of injuries, but let's say um, this bucket has a line on it that has the threshold um, for an athlete to develop a bone stress injury or, um, or an injury to their bone. And you pour in, um, maybe there's some underfueling tendencies, some underfueling tendencies, maybe some overtraining. So you're pouring those in and so the bucket's slowly filling up. Now, if there is a genetic history uh, or it's some genetic um, links, because there are um, some some already some single nuclear polymorphisms, some SNPs. Um, so those are different um, genetic breakdowns that are linked to low bone mineral density. So if you pour that in as well, um, that could be enough to raise over the threshold or over the line of bone stress injury. So I think um, I think if you have a genetic history, I do I do believe that um, good um, environmental practices can sometimes um, curb some of those um, risks or at least mitigate or decrease the, the risk, but it, it's not um, overall protective. So, yeah. Um, and we have some interesting research that I won't, um, we're still, we're underpowered right now, but we're looking at ultra endurance runners and kind of factoring in genetic, hormonal, um, kind of nutritional risk and um, trying to determine which factors are uh, maybe protective or which are most predictive of um, bone health. Well, that'll be super interesting, especially, I mean, that's a huge energy expenditure mm -hmm. in that sport. I mean, it's, you just gotta, and it seems to be a sport that's just booming. Yes. Um, and I'm guessing during COVID-19, uh, it's probably maybe booming even more from a stress. I've met people who've just started running that just suddenly are like running longer and running longer and running. Longer. <laughs> no, I ran 25 kilometers today. I'm like, oh, okay. <gasps> casual <Right>. dog. <laughs> They're not even runners. So yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. And then I'm sure the nutritional factor in a lot there. You mentioned males and I just wanted to come back to that because I think sometimes a lot of people kind of relegate bone disease to women. Like, oh, that's a, that's a woman's thing. But that's not the case. And there's a lot more research now, I find, uh, looking at males. And, and even with the relative energy deficiency syndrome now spreading over to incorporate males into that. As a runner and as a clinician that sees a lot of runners, do you see, you know, is it just a, a larger proportion of females getting the stress fractures? Or are you you see quite a few males as well. I, I do. I see quite a few males. I'd say I probably maybe see equal males and females that come into my clinic. And it might just be kind of just by word of mouth. And um, I don't think I can really apply that to the general population um, as a whole or general running population as a whole. But um, I do see males getting bone stress injuries due to um, the male athlete triads so due to that low energy availability. And I think what's um, most frustrating and sometimes heartbreaking as a clinician is um, maybe they they made some habits, um, some poor habits a, a year ago, and we are still seeing some of the consequences and um, re-injuries um, based on those habits. So even though they've made all of these changes, it just takes time for the, that bone to get strong again. And right. so I, I will say that um, males are definitely not off the hook in, in regard to um, bone um, health risk. Um, say that one more time. <laughs> <laughs> males, listen up. <laughs> this, is, yeah, exactly. this pertains to you too. And the challenge is um, there are just there are less studies, and we're trying to do more studies on on male athletes. Um, we're trying to figure out what if there needs to be different thresholds or um, kind of upper limits and lower limits of normal as far as kind of body mass index and even just the low energy availability calculation. Does that need to be adjusted? And what labs do we look for? And what's the threshold for that? Um, there's some debate about whether testosterone is a good marker for low energy availability, or should we use something? Um, some studies even show that even estradiol levels in men can be a better indicator of low energy availability than testosterone. So there are some, there's definitely some more um, science and research that needs to be done. But mm -hmm. um, in general, I, I do think it's important, um, both from a bone health 
and overall um, kind of physiologic health. And, um, and that's kind of like the cortisol and like stress hormones, um, that piece, but then also just performance. Um, if, Absolutely. If an athlete wants to perform at their best, they need to be thinking about all of these things. Right. And you make a really good point that, you know, it might be difficult sometimes to have people connect with, oh, bone, but it does take a long time to heal compared to maybe a muscle strain. And then, I mean, you're not going to get a DEX every two months because you're not going to see anything. So that's just kind of actually speaks to that. Mm -hmm. Like there's a reason you're going to do it maybe a year or even two years. So yeah, it's an injury that, you know, if you break a bone, like chances are you're going to be off for a while versus if you just strain a muscle. So maybe sometimes that can make someone go, okay, I should, I should pay attention because even as a cyclist, right, if you break your collarbone, sure, you can sit on the trainer, but you're not going mountain biking anytime soon mm -hmm. um, unless you're just Herculean. But um, as far as your, a lot of your research on bone stress injuries, so that's a little, a little different than just the low energy availability. How about overtraining or lack of rest if you have adequate nutrition? So what's happening there? I mean, your bike analogy is definitely coming back here, but <laughs> how is that, uh, how is that impacting the bone? Yeah. So, um, I mean, it's kind of back to, yeah, the, the bike analogy and, um, it's kind of like going back on your bike while the paint's still drying. <laughs> you need, oh, you yeah. need to, you need to let the paint dry. You need to let the paint set. Otherwise you're losing, I mean, you're losing the gain of, of the paint job of the bone re or of the bone remodeling. Um, so especially when, um, you stress the body, whether it's on the bike or through big runs, um, there's a lot of stimulus and load and um, strain. And if that if that bone um, gets too much stimulus um, and that accumulates over time, then that, um, I also use a paperclip analogy. So you kind of, you bend the paperclip and if you keep bending it, um, it eventually can break. And thankfully in our case, um, we don't, we have the ability to kind of reinforce that paper clip um, as opposed yeah. to just keep it at that very weak spot. But um, I do, I see that. And so you kind of, you need to think about really an individual approach to an athlete. Um, where are they in their training cycle? Um, kind of something very relevant right now with, with COVID and um, the overall increase in running. Um, I, I'm, I'm seeing more overuse injuries come into my clinic, even if it's just the, the run of the mill shin splint, because, um, an athlete isn't doing anything else because they don't have access to, um, a lot of other things. Right. So they're running mm -hmm. all the time on the same type of terrain at the same speed, um, maybe doing like more hills or more, um, kind of, kind of even more intensity. And, and that is putting extra stress and strain on the, on the bone. So, um, even despite having optimal nutrition, um, kind of you, if you fill that bucket completely with overtraining, it's still going to hit that um, bone stress injury um, threshold in that line. And so that's super important. rest and recovery and, days are important. Oh, for sure. And do you see, do you see a lot of injuries when, let's say in high school students, I know you do a lot of work with young athletes when they jump to the collegiate level? Yeah, so I think that's a tough. I, I do think um, collegiate coaches are doing um, a much better job about um, either throughout the summer slowly introducing um, volume and um, kind of overall mileage and duration, or even using that freshman year. I think this is the the best solution is to kind of use that freshman year as that kind of accumulation and build up year, and and really have an athlete um, adjust because you don't know what they're coming from as far as um, training and um, overall volume. And it could it could increase by 50%. And, right. and that's a lot and that's too much. And mm -hmm. add on the pressure and stress of, um, add on the pressure and stress of college and right. new nutrition, new diet, probably not good sleep strategies to start. And it's just a recipe for um, some type of injury or burnout or just kind of mental fatigue. And I do think that that um, plays a role in the um, just overall body's ability to, to bounce back from um, a high, high intensity workout or week and ability to fully recover and um, re remodel and heal uh, well enough for the next, next day and next effort. 
Yeah, for sure. It's great how you, you know, you're always thinking about all the pieces of the pie. And that's, that's just so important as an athlete, right? I think sometimes people just get so fixated on training, training, training. But, you know, now we're learning more and more how, you know, sleep is the best free performance enhancer you have. And then you have nutrition and there's all these things that make you that great athlete. And, you know, rest is when you know, a lot of the strength actually comes to fruition. So, yeah, it's great. It's great that you're teaching these young athletes. How do you find, um, I know a lot of, there's a lot of archaic thinking still in sports organizations. And is that something you're able to convey to young athletes and their parents to kind of keep an eye out for, like as far as maybe old thoughts about, oh, you have to be super lean and you have to look a certain way. And because that can really cause a lot of problems for young, very easily influenced athletes. Do you deal with a lot of that with your athletes? Um, I do. And it's usually, um, unfortunately, kind of, it, it comes in when they present with an injury. And and I start to learn more about the, the culture within that sport or within um, the peers or the other um, athletes on the team. And mm -hmm. um, there's still um, this this notion that um, in female athletes they may that it's okay to lose their period during um, high intensity training, for example, in the middle of mm -hmm. a season, um, a cross country or track and field season, and and I continually have to educate that that's not normal, and that loss of period is an early is a is a good sign that something's off. And yeah. the athlete should kind of reflect, um, think about um, maybe the last couple of weeks, what's changed. Um, maybe they were um, unintentionally under fueling or not um, really not, or maybe they were skipping breakfast, um, doing um, things that uh, just kind of maybe they were not even aware of some of those habits. Um, yeah. But there's also, yeah, a culture um, that's still around about kind of a certain look that an athlete um, should be um, should have for um, their sports and um, that lean look, and especially in adolescent years and those teenage years. So these these females and males are going to go through some major changes. Um, it's called right. puberty, and it can yeah. be <laughs> it can be challenging and sometimes not so fun. Um, what what how the body changes, but that's but it's important, and that's yeah. a sign that their body is. Um, kind of, and that's, that's normal. And, um, I try to just lay it out there for, especially for females that your body's going to go through changes and your training may take a little bit of a hit for a while. And that's, and it should like you're, you may feel like you're, um, kind of developing these kind of in the hips and, um, in the chest. And that's, that's a normal part of, part of development. And, it's it's okay to 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 have that that dip in performance, and if anything, I would I would embrace that because um, that's that's a healthier approach and a better long term approach than mm -hmm. the delayed puberty because of this overtraining underfueling tendency, and and that's it's really hard for a young athlete to 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 hear when um, their peers maybe aren't at that same at that same level and they're trying to compare themselves to their peers. And so I'm right. um, trying to empower the athlete that they're an individual and um, that, that they need to um, really love their body for what, for what it is, um, is, is important to instill early. And that's um, for females, um, but also for males too. They're, um, they go through some, some changes um, as far as kind of, muscle development and that will um, potentially affect their performance, um, maybe even take a hit, but long term, they'll be stronger and their bones will be stronger. So mm -hmm. um, those are some important pieces. And um, one other thing, one important thing that um, I think gets a little, um, it's still a little confusing for um, athletes is the use of um, oral contraceptives or um, hormonal, oh, I'm so glad you're bringing hormonal yeah, replacement <laughs> yeah. um, to, to, uh, for, for irregular periods or for missed periods. And I still do see that on occasion. I see it less. Um, sometimes it's prescribed by um, a primary care provider or it was recommended. And so then the athlete requests it, but requests it, but um, doesn't get into um, the deep, deeper details of why. 
And so just to give some background, um, um, hormonal in historically, um, hormone, hormonal contraception um, was prescribed um, for irregular periods, um, especially when an athlete would would present, um, even though there was likely a an underlying cause of low energy availability that wasn't really um, revealed or, or addressed. And so um, back to that Band-Aid and supplement, um, that, that hormonal replacement is really just a Band-Aid and it isn't fixing the underlying um, chronic energy deficit. And that hormonal replacement, especially in the form of an oral contraceptive pill, isn't going to be enough hormone to um, Re affect um, positively affect the bone remodeling, and and really, I think it can be more confusing for an athlete because it masks the the important sign of um, regular periods as as part of um, a normal um, kind of healthy um, nutrition balance and energy balance. Yeah, this is so important because I've I've worked with a couple of of young athletes who you know when I have you know, an information collection period. And it's like, oh, you know, asking about birth control and menstruation. And there's always this assumption of, oh, I'm getting my period. So, you know, I've read about this reds, but I must be fine. But really it's that whole, could you explain what the withdrawal bleed is? Because I think that's really important for, for athletes to understand. Yeah. Yeah. So um, now in, in, or when an athlete takes like an oral contraceptive, they're getting a steady, stimulus of of a hormone and and at at the the normal menstruation let me see if i can try and explain this in less um, medical terms <laughs> uh, <laughs> so the the with, withdrawal bleed is is a typical um sign of the um kind of the progesterone and um for example like an athlete will go through like a progestin challenge and they receive the progestin, and that stimulates the um, withdrawal of the or the shedding of the lining of the the uterine lighting. I'm really getting mm -hmm. into some some good anatomy here. And, oh, that's okay. And um, and, and that that can be um, that can that can lead to um, um, bleeding. Um, so that would be like the menstrual period piece. And mm -hmm. um, with with the hormonal supplementation that an athlete gets um, through the, the oral contraceptive, you still get that, still can get that withdrawal bleed, um, but that doesn't mean that the, the ovulation, um, so kind of the next step up, um, is is normalized. So there can still be a withdrawal bleed, and and there still can be um, an anovulatory cycle. So um, kind of the way the way a, a female gets pregnant is through um, ovulation of a, so an egg. Kind of now we're getting more into kind of the fertility piece too. Um, That's important, though. Yeah. yeah, it's very important. So, so it's it's important to to for an athlete to to experience that that withdrawal bleed as as part of the, that normal sign of those normal um, hormones functioning. And even then, um, it it may just it may not be enough. So I just I think that I can't emphasize enough how. Um, Oral contraceptives are are not a solution to um, irregular menstrual cycles in a young athlete. And right, is there a type of? I think I actually recall. I'm not sure if it was a podcast with you or Margot Mountjoy, but um, I recall what, what they spoke about. But I'll just ask you to explain it. Is there a type of contraceptive that is a little different than all the others in that it wouldn't mask the hormones? Um, is it the copper? Yeah, the copper IUD is, I feel like that one is probably the most, the best, but it's still, as far as like, if you're trying to get a hormone testing, um, the copper IUD can still suppress the bleeding, and okay. and I would say an IUD. As far as if you're going to choose, um, if you're if you are trying to use um, a hormonal contraception for contraceptive purposes, um, the recommendation is is an IUD as far as over oral contraception. But, okay. 
So definitely something that athletes should be talking to their physicians about if, you know, they are especially like elite athlete and possibly dealing with relative energy deficiency and you really want to see how your body's operating, you can't really see that clearly when you're on a typical hormonal con contraceptive. I mean, that's such a huge point. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask you, you know, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you feel is really important for athletes to understand in regards to preventing bone injuries or something for young athletes beginning like on a journey, maybe up in their training or changing sports settings, anything that you feel like we haven't touched on that is kind of like a big message that you like to leave athletes with? Yeah, I think um, a couple. One, um, I, I spoken about this earlier, but just trying to avoid um, comparing um, an athlete to another athlete, especially um, um, as an athlete is, is developing and um, you, you can't put yourself in another athlete's shoes based on a number of reasons. I mean, different training, history, development um, changes, and um, just kind of respecting kind of where that up, like where you are at that time um, is an important, just kind of more of that psychological piece. Um, mm -hmm. I think encouraging some form of um, resistance exercise or strength training, um, as that can be a good stimulus um, to, to bone, um, is really important um, for a number of reasons, both for bone health and also um, I think that it just kind of balances out some muscles that maybe an athlete doesn't um, target in um, a cycling motion or a running motion. So all those other kind of yeah. more supporting muscles that aren't getting as much um, much uh, stimulus or load that are really important to help kind of just stabilize and support the body. Um, mm -hmm. Another thing that I think um, we didn't really talk about was just um, different um, dietary restrictions. So if an athlete right. has a, a gluten intolerance or gluten um, sensitivity, um, it's even harder to absorb certain nutrients. And um, I think it's it's really important to touch base with um, an expert like you to make sure that they're getting um, enough carbohydrates and they're getting enough um, vitamin D and iron because um, I do see that um, sometimes that um, absorption of iron is really um, ch challenge. It's really challenging to get um, optimal iron um, in the typical ways um, in those in those athletes, and that can mm -hmm. lead to. Um, like an iron deficiency can lead to um, fatigue, just early fatigability, which then can lead to poor biomechanics, whether it's on the bike or on, on a run and could lead to um, kind of abnormal load to a bone, which could even increase that risk of that injury. So I think it's important to, to think about that. And let me see, I feel like I had one other little piece takeaway just the rest and recovery. Um, another another rest or recovery day, especially especially right now when um, there's so much emotional um, stress and chronic stress that's um, happening. Um, kind of giving yourself um, a little bit of grace with with that um, is is valuable because um, that sleep is, is so important, and we see it's, it, um, all the studies on um, the effects on performance and injury risk reduction, um, and including bone health. No, that's amazing. And I couldn't agree more with the, the rest and recovery. You know, if for those who who maybe do have more time, they might think more time, more training, but, you know, everything has its threshold where things might start to fall apart. Right. And maybe instead of more training, try some meditation or some weightlifting or, or something a little more holistic to maybe contribute to another piece of your, your healthy athletic pie, yes. so to speak. Yes. <laughs> um, well, gosh, I mean, I could ask you a million questions, but I definitely want to respect your time. I am super grateful for your time and, and even your ability to transfer scientific knowledge in, in a way that can be easily understood. Your analogy is amazing about the paint and the bike chips. I'm never going to forget that. It's better than mine with the icing and the cake. <laughs> <gasps> I like that one too. I have a massive sweet tooth. So I was like, ooh, cake. Yes. <laughs> That's awesome. So we mentioned in the beginning, you know, it's difficult for people to personally connect with the importance of bone health because we don't see it or feel it or you know, you're not at the gym saying, oh, my bones. But that's exactly why I think conversations like this are, are so important. And I just feel like there's a huge lack of 
you know, if you're in the world of science and bone, yeah, sure, we could read about this all day, but it's not what you're seeing when you flip open a magazine mm-hmm. or you're flipping through the internet. So the more conversations like this that we can have and people listen to to prevent bone injury and, and make our later years in life um, better and even our years younger as athletes, uh, the better. So your work is super valuable. I'm definitely going to continue following your research and I really appreciate your time today. Yeah, thank you. And you asked some really good questions and it's it's nice to be able to, to share this with the world. And um, I just am really honored to be on your podcast. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, hopefully we will connect again soon. Yes, I hope so. Thank you. I really enjoyed that conversation with Dr. Emily Krause. It solidified for me the importance of educating athletes and coaches about optimal nutrition intakes and even rest, right? We all love to train hard and we know that we can create a lot of adaptations through hard training, but that includes the rest portion of the training cycle. So I really like how Dr. Krauss brought that message home and really amplifying how important the rest part of the cycle is. I hope that you were able to walk away from this conversation with even one practical tip that you can apply today to your training or just to your life that can help improve your performance or your longevity just as a healthy human being, um, both of which really should go in tandem. And really, I'm glad that you're able to tune in and listen to Emily. I thought her analogies on how bone remodeling occurs were fantastic. And hopefully that helped give a little bit more context to everything that we were talking about today. So thank you so much again for tuning in and I'm looking forward to sharing more conversations with you here on the Performance Hub.